In order to detect and precisely measure the tiny fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background, the detectors must be cooled. The LFI is cooled to 20 Kelvin. The HFI is also cooled, but to 0.1 Kelvin, just one-tenth of a degree above absolute zero. The innovative cooling system wraps around the HFI in progressively cooler layers, each protecting the next part of the system from radiation and heat given off by the warmer outer layers. These are V-grooves, cone-shaped reflecting surfaces that insulate the instruments, providing the first stage of the cooling process down to 50 Kelvin. The next layer cools both instruments, the LFI to 20 Kelvin and the HFI to 18 Kelvin. This is achieved through a sorption cooler, which thermally cycles compressors that are filled with metal hydride to absorb and desorb hydrogen gas. To reach the temperature required for the HFI, a Jules Thompson refrigerator driven by mechanical compressors is used. This employs helium gas to reduce the temperature to 4 Kelvin. The innermost layer of the cooling system is a dilution refrigerator that mixes together two isotopes of helium. A change in enthalpy occurs during dilution, which cools the helium mixture to just 0.1 Kelvin. The cooling system, detectors and the mirrors sit on top of a service module, which contains all the hardware the spacecraft needs to function. A solar panel at the base of the spacecraft provides power and protection from direct sunlight. Planck has two reflector mirrors that gather and focus light onto the detectors. The telescope and instruments are surrounded by a large baffle. The baffle is used to radiate heat, generated by the focal plane of the detectors out into space. It also provides the instrument coolers with a stable and cold background environment. To ensure data collected is as accurate as possible, Planck's orbit is at the second Lagrangian point, known as L2. Here, three forces balance, the Earth's gravity, the Sun's gravity, and the centripetal force of the rotating system. L2 is located about one and a half million kilometers away from Earth. That's nearly four times further from us than the Moon. From this location, Planck keeps his payload in the shade and the solar array always facing towards the Sun. A huge challenge faced when measuring the cosmic microwave background is light from other microwave sources straying onto the detectors. For example, the Earth is 99 times more luminous in the microwave than the cosmic microwave background. By launching into a far Earth orbit, this problem is minimized, as the angular size of the Earth is considerably reduced. From L2, the Earth looks the same size as the full moon does when viewed from Earth. The Planck spacecraft spins once a minute, and as it does, the field of view sweeps a ring of 170 degrees in diameter. Planck can scan the entire sky in six months. To produce a map of the cosmic microwave background, the data must be cleaned of all sources of noise and thoroughly processed. An advantage of using many frequencies to detect the cosmic microwave background is that sources of microwaves that lie in the foreground can be stripped away with greater precision. When maps of the cosmic microwave background are first viewed, you notice there is an asymmetry known as the cosmic dipole. This is due to the Doppler effect caused by the motion of the Earth and the Sun with respect to the background radiation. Removing the dipole reveals the temperature variations present across the entire sky. Here, microwaves emitted by the Milky Way are visible as a red band in front of the cosmic microwave background. This signal can also be removed in the process providing useful information about our galaxy. Away from the plane of the Milky Way, among variations or anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background, lurks microwave emission from distant galaxies and galaxy clusters. Each class of object has a distinct spectrum which allows it to be distinguished from the rest and hence removed. Once all of this astrophysical noise has been removed, the most notable features remaining in the maps are small characteristic spots. Data collected by Planck will be carefully analyzed in a number of different ways to look for specific patterns of spots and for evidence of polarized light. Uh, what I would like that Planck uh, will discover is uh, what I defined uh, the bipolarization of the cosmic microwave background, uh, the polarized field in uh, the magnetic, magnetic polarized field of the CMB. 
because this would mean that we understand the uh, or origin of our universe, we understand the gravitational waves, we understand the quantum fluctuations which at the very beginning, just after the Big Bang, gave rise to the structure that we see today in the universe. This would be an overprice, not to me, but to, to the team. There are lots of questions that Planck will answer by itself. Okay. Now, there, it's also an enabling experiment for future generations. And it's instructive that most of the science case of the large experiments, you know, proposed in the next 10 to 20 years are already taken Planck for, for granted as a success. And they are all trying to sort of focus how they can build up on this to answer the next round of questions. In this forecast, we have taken a closer look at the Planck mission and seen how, by detecting the first light of the universe, it will provide the information needed to tackle some of astronomy's big questions. Now, we will just have to wait patiently and look forward to the exciting results. I'm Rebecca Barnes. Thank you for watching this Science at ESA podcast.